A fanatic of a man. I draw myself to the bed of day. What goes up must come down. What goes up must come down, 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 down. I draw myself to the edge. What goes up must come down. So please, please come here and stay with me for a while. As all I see through these tears, all these years we got never come. Waking up. So please, please, don't you cry. I will separate you all、oh, so soon under the California sky, beneath the pale light of the moon. It's waking up alone. One more time, one more time. It's in you I found all my dreams. So I. Make it through one more time. There is no other for me. No, 
Cause you defy all I thought could be When it's all said and done We will still see the sun so clear So please, please come here and stay with me for a while. Is all I see through these tears. All these years we got left. All I thought could be So when it's all come undone We will still see the sun So please, please don't you cry I will sit with you oh so soon Under a California sky We need the feel For me, no Cause you defy all I thought could be When it's all said and done We will still see the sun so clear
Hello once again and welcome back to the Front Porch Podcast here on twitch.tv slash worldwide underscore whippy. You can get in contact with us by giving us an email at frontporchpodcast1 at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter at Podcast Front. Uh, if you want to check out the archive of previous episodes, we're on anchor.fm slash frontporchpodcast. Thank you, Fred, for finally changing that name over so that way people can recognize it and not have to spell your name. There you go. Anything that makes things easier. And hey, how, uh, mention to them about following us on Twitch. Where are we on that? I understand uh, oh. we're getting closer. Well, that's what I said here on twitch.tv slash worldwide underscore wimpy. Fred, we're 15 people away from getting everything taken care of and getting affiliated to where uh, we can get actual monetary support from uh, our fans if they want to donate or ads from Twitch for being partnered up with them. Uh, you just click that little follow button. If you look at the very top right of your screen, you will see that. Just click that. It costs you absolutely nothing. It helps us out, and you can make yourself feel better by helping out Fred, because Fred needs some help right now. So, Fred's in a little trouble, but uh, we, we won't mention that too much here. Although I will tell you guys that things need to start working out, or we're only about three or four podcasts away from the end of the series, because I'll end up having to sell the computer. <laughs> and we don't want to do that um we'd really rather not no. so if you were here for our last episode i was doing a social experiment uh with a group that i use on discord uh using sim city on the super nintendo today we're going to be playing civilization civilization 6 where i'm going to be playing trehan of the roman empire uh if you're not familiar with civilization you start off with periods of of eras of man and you build them up until you get the victory either with science or with culture or with religion or by conquering everyone however you think civilizations can win is how you can win in this game so uh speaking of civilizations uh fascinating news all this week uh no one still knows who won the the, the iowa primary yet fred Iowa caucuses. And by the way, before we go any further, why don't we introduce our special guest? Well, I was going to get to that because I was going to bring up uh, how Andrew Yang performed and knowing that you are an Andrew Yang supporter and you wanted to bring on somebody who had uh, really good ideas about how women are affected by the economy and what Yang can be doing or what other candidates could be doing. Uh, we have a very special guest here on the Front Porch Podcast, our very first guest, ironically enough. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and Introduce yourself, our, our fanciful guest. All right. My name is Faye Koo. Um, I am, I've been yanking for, I don't know, since last maybe June or July, something like that. And uh, I guess I met um, Fred through the Yang Gang and uh, found Fred's, you know, writings and um, discussion is really interesting. He invited me to listen to his very first podcast, and I thought it was a, a really good start. 
I gave him some different uh, suggestions, and it looks like he's been taking them, and I, I really see his podcast maturing, and I'm, he has a great friend in you, uh, Wimpy. So uh, I think we need more voices speaking out for gang, you know, of all different, different types. I, people know that, you know, this is a serious movement of all kinds of people. Well, I, I do appreciate your feedback and listening to uh, our show, and we're very happy to have you on. Uh, if you don't mind, just uh, let people know a little bit about yourself, uh, just professionally, or, or any credentials that you would have that would say, hey, this person may know what they're talking about. Ah, well, I mean, I can go all the way back to when I was uh, a student. I, was, I graduated from the UC Berkeley with a degree in integrative biology. And I have a minor in French, so I. Parle du français. Uh, un peu. Uh, un peu. That's all I know of French. I was gonna say, don't. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? I can do that. Ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch. Ah, speak, um, a fantastic. Bit of five different languages, probably. <laughs> oh, so. Yeah, my 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 first language was uh, Mandarin. And I learned that in, uh, I was born in Taiwan, Andrew Yang. And um, I came to the United States when I was six years old. And so really didn't have a choice. You know, my parents kind of brought me here. And then, um, but I have spent year in Taiwan. And that was the year when my child, my youngest, um, I was with my youngest, I was pregnant with him. And I was really afraid of trying to give birth here in the United States because that was a year before we were talking about universal health and um, or we were at Obamacare at the time. Is that the, that's what they called it here? Yes, that's, and, it. that's um, what they call it here. Yeah, but I know that that in Taiwan they have universal, true universal. It's single payer care, and so yeah. I actually went to Taiwan to have my baby because I was a single mom. Um, the father was not involved. I was um, having a lot of legal issues and I needed to keep the money that I had from my divorce um, to uh, deal with my legal issues. And so um, I had this one incident where uh, Zephyr <laughs> didn't have a name at the time, but as a, you know, just when he was inside me still, I, I had this one day when I accidentally ate too much, um, some kind of a Korean barbecue or something, and it wasn't fully cooked maybe, and it made me really sick. So I um, I had to call the ambulance and come get me. Couldn't actually get off the toilet upstairs. <laughs> and I thought, I'm never gonna make it downstairs, and my friend is too far away to come get me, I'll just call the ambulance. And that day they charged me $3,000. Four big men came in an ambulance, carried me down the stairs, <laughs> put me on a stretcher. Oh. And I think what they really gave me was like an IV in my arm. And that really made me feel a lot better because I was mostly dehydrated. But, yeah. um, but I thought to myself, if I continue living in the United States, and I started thinking about, you know, it was going to cost me $20,000 to give birth in a hospital in Los Angeles. And I knew that because I had given birth before and I already had a C-section. So they don't allow you to go, you know, you can't, um, you can't go back. They call it a V-back to have another vaginal birth. And vaginal births are a lot less expensive, but they're still like four to $5,000 in a big hospital. So without healthcare um, coverage and stuff after my divorce, I was looking at $20,000 so it's appearing. And then what if there was a complication? You know, medical expenses could get way out of hand. So um, I took myself and my unborn child to Taiwan. And um, so I learned a lot about differences between the United States and Taiwan from, from that one year that I lived there. And now I'm excited that we have an actual Taiwanese, um, kind of Taiwanese American. Um, Andrew Game was born in the United States but his parents have returned back to Taiwan, the same as my parents. So that's something that um, the sort of a special um, affinity with, because I feel like a lot of his policies are understandable based on, you know, the same kinds of cultural things that he would know about that, uh, that I know about. 
Uh, I can uh, I can definitely relate to that. Um, being from Chicago mm -hmm. and uh, with Barack Obama becoming president, uh, he was a White Sox fan, and I'm a huge White Sox fan. And he kind of grew up in the area that I'm familiar with in Chicago, so I, I understand where you're coming from from that. And um, that's what I wanted to kind of discuss today was Andrew Lang Yang broadly, but it sounds like you know from your experience with dealing with uh, the medical side of things with with the problems with how much they charge for birthing a citizen in this country, essentially, uh, that you would have an idea of what kind of policies he would have in changing the economics. So we'll go ahead and start with that. Um, what exactly different does Andrew Yang propose when it comes to economics, maybe specifically with women? Well, that's the thing, is he's got his mandate, if we elect Andrew Yang, the only mandate we would have is his uh, signature policy, which is the UBI in the form of $1,000 a month for every American citizen 18 and up. And that would be, that's what we call the freedom dividend, right? And a lot of people were kind of critical about his um, last debate performance. We were just talking about that. And what they were cr critical of me about was here we are, all these Yang Gang people who've all listened to Andrew Yang speak <laughs> many, many times. And he constantly talks about the freedom dividend. And whenever you ask him a question, he often pivots back to this because really that is the answer to a lot of the world's problems. Okay? <laughs> yeah, last night I think he, was, he brought it up as uh, a, a, what are we going to do about the uh, people of color divide in that you know, black people don't have some of the same opportunities that white people does do. And I think he, you know, he pivoted back then and said, well, you know what, let's give them a thousand dollars a month. We'll start evening things up, you know? Yes, because I mean, what could be more important than the fact that black people have only 10% net worth of the average white person? Right. You know, it's an average, it's an average average. So there's always a wealthy black person. There's always you know, a poor white person, but on yes, average. I know one, but yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, right. But I mean, it's it's uh, really scary. And so when you have that, of course, you're going to have a stereotype that the black person is always poor. Right. But, you know, and the stereotype comes from something true. There's something, there's a bit of truth in there that created that stereotype. And it creates all of this. Um, it's not even necessarily racism if, if it's really that, you know, you think that, this group of people will not be res uh, will not be as dependable because they don't have the finances to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Being poor makes you extremely unreliable. <laughs> you well, can't handle does. any little emergency. Yeah. Well, that's that's really why uh, employee employers have started asking, "Do you have a vehicle to get to work?" Uh, that is a strict. That is a question strictly asking, "Are you poor?" Um, if you look at yes, how they they use true. it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about, uh, Yang and pivoting toward the, uh, the universal, f the freedom dividend, right? So mm -hmm. with that freedom dividend, uh, my question would be, and I, I think it's, it's a tangible question as to the difference between Yang and someone like Bernie Sanders is a lot of people are having issue with the fact that Yang wants to give this toward every American and that, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, AOC came out against Yang for saying, hey, we're going to give free education to everyone in the country. And uh, their contending point is, well, the ultra rich who already have everything, they can afford to, to send their kid to, to private school and are doing so. We want to give public education, free public education to everyone else. Um, and we should exclude them. Um, I, I think that... AOC and Bernie Sanders are wrong for that. I think if you give an opportunity to everyone, you need to give an opportunity to everyone. Um, everyone yeah. So right. So I've had a uh, I've had a very very different kind of life. Maybe I mean everybody's unique. I've had the chance to live in a lot of different areas of the United States, kind of like Andrew. You know, he's been out in the big cities, and then he went to the rural areas, and he went to the slums, and he went to all different areas to try. And, and everywhere he went, he saw something different. And I've had that experience myself. I've lived all over the country. Um, I've also had a life when I was wealthy in the past. I, I started out maybe sort of middle, you know, poor middle class with, um, with my immigrant parents. 
And then uh, my parents had at some point lost a house that they had purchased because they couldn't pay on it, you know. And then, um, <clears throat> but my dad was an architect, so how bad could, how badly was he really doing? You know, it's like <laughs> I felt yeah. for, but he was okay. He was fine. Mm -hmm. And then um, we went to, uh, I went on and uh, married somebody who was a computer programmer, and he was doing very well in his life comparatively to other people. We never had to worry about money, really. You know, I don't think, like, it was just like, uh, as long as we kind of stay within our means, anything we wanted, we could probably have it. And so I've, I've lived these different lives. And now, after all the divorce and the um, sort of not having a, a partner and having terrible legal issues, which really completely, you know, like, once when you go into family court, I think this is the part I was trying to um, talk to Fred about, is that... Women have this experience that if you get a if you're married, right, you're fairly stable. But if you try to get a divorce, it can be absolutely horrible, right, for both sides. Um, but if you're the one who is the person who's taking care of the children, um, you're expected to continue taking care of the children, and you want to. I mean, that's that's why you stay home with them, right? Um, so for me, I wanted to be with my children, but that meant I was powerless in court. It didn't matter that at the time I had a lot of money, <clears throat> and so my 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 uh, ex husband could always take me back to court even after the initial divorce, which took almost two years. And um, you know, you just fight back and forth. You pay a lot of money out to lawyers, and you know that your money is always going to diminish every year. And you have to save all that money. You can't just invest it because you're going to need it for more additional, you know, legal fights. <laughs> You know it's right. never going to end. So, you know, unless you have a great income that is equal to your ex and um, you're both really equally taking care of the children and all that, and you have as few fights as possible, you know, it's really dangerous. And so you may, I think there's a lot of people out there who are women and they can never really leave that relationship. Um, and I'm off, I'm in a lot of groups other women like this, but I eventually, and I'm sort of like, I go and tell them all my horror stories, you know, <laughs> and make something twice about, hmm, should I really start this process? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not right that women always have to um, take the greater risk. And, and for the most part, it really is like that because a man by himself can, you know, have more, uh, f have more time to devote to work. And if you're the one who has all the children in your house, um, they even the legal system actually decides where you can live, because you know they don't. They say we can't decide where the adults live. We can decide where the women live. And so having an, uh, a basic income is not something that you know you you don't know that you're going to need it, right? You could be very wealthy right now, which I was at the time, but because I didn't have a basic income when I went to court, I had no power. I knew it would always be the loser <laughs> in, okay. in terms of, you know, I, I have to pay out legal fees that I can't afford because no income is coming in. Only stuff is going out. Right. Yeah. Right. And even with a thousand dollars, um, that would be something to show for it. And that would be something that you could say, Hey, um, I'm able to, you know, afford to, to do this little thing or do that other thing, you know, for the kids. So, well, you know, I, I wasn't thinking about it just in terms of, of legal battles, which is new because mm -hmm. I hadn't considered that. I have, you know, you hear many times about women who are stuck in abusive relationships and mm -hmm. they can't leave because they can't afford it. They, they cannot earn enough money while they're taking care of kids and all of that, that they can possibly mm -hmm. afford to leave. A thousand dollars a month, I mean, in fact, would give them freedom, I would think, or at, at least enough to be able to say, okay, I can go. And, you know, no, a thousand dollars a month isn't really enough to live on. But, you know, if you do what I did and find a couple of other people, uh, you know, if, if, if we had the freedom dividend right now, my problems would be gone. Each of my roommates and I would have a thousand bucks. That's three thousand dollars a month. You can live on that. You're you know, you're not buying a new swimming pool next week, but you're paying the rent and you're keeping the electricity on. You're paying for mm -hmm. groceries and things like that. So I, you know, I was thinking, women in abusive relationships have mm -hmm. a greater opportunity 
to escape those. Am I wrong? What What is your take on that? Absolutely, but the but the most people think of an abusive relationship as oh the man her you know or he's uh, doing something awful to kids or drinking a lot or doing something horrible right. But we're talking. Right. What about people who just have a have have had a terrible choice? These two people don't get along, and one person feels extremely stuck. You know, just how about just normal stuff? You know, uh, yeah. people don't get it. Don't have good choices. And then when you're a single woman with children, you know, you, you, you can't take the risk of ever not having a place to stay. So you're going to arrange something. And then um, you need somebody else to help you sometimes. You can't go on your own without that extra thousand. Yeah. And so then you get stuck into these other relationships where, like you said, you were talking about in the other podcast I heard, um, where you end up doing everything you can to please your other housemate even if it's a woman yeah. even if it's you know your sure. mom right yeah you're staying with your parents and you're like doing everything you can to keep happy you want to keep your children quiet you know and it's not normal for them yeah. <laughs> you know they want to be children but you just so you don't lose your people. place yeah exactly it, it, because it is for me homelessness is about the most terrifying thing uh there is and i've been really close like one, two, three, four times now, I have been extraordinarily close. Time number five comes up in about six weeks. But, uh, you know, and, you know, I know I couldn't live that way. My my body would set, particularly in Mesa. Uh, I live in Mesa, Arizona, and I'll probably be okay if we end up homeless in April. I might make it through April, maybe May, but after that, it's so hot that I'll simply die. Um, you, you have to be able wow. to get in out of the heat. Um, and right now, it's not terribly cold here. Wimpy would laugh at our temperatures, but it gets down to like 34, 35 at night. And, uh, oh, my God, that's so cold. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> my <laughs> God. But, but Wimpy, if you were sleeping outside in that, it would feel pretty so, cold. So here, here's the thing. Uh, I met Fred living in Arizona, and every single winter, I slept with my window open. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you're a deeply sick man. So, yeah. Well, that that's that's for other reasons, Fred. Okay? No need to get yeah. personal. Of course you Personal wide Wimpy. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong one. Okay, uh, but... But, you know, and that's that's kind of one of the things I wanted to ask about, too, is, you know, how the how do you think the what what am I not seeing in the world? What am I missing in my experience that I would understand better if I were female is what am I missing? Because I'm male well, and probably, I don't. Probably the first thing that most men don't think about is just um, the fact that most a lot of women are busy caring for children or for, you know, their parents or somebody. So mm -hmm. they can't take the risks that a, that a man can if a man is, does not have to do that responsibility. Um, I would I would think that's one of the, the, the biggest things is that we often have. Mm -hmm. So um, and then if you need to flee a situation, you need to take a person with you. You know, and you can't yeah. just, even if you're very healthy, what if uh, old, you know, yeah. or if that person's very old and frail, you know, yeah. you really can't subject your mom, you know, who's 80 years old and uh, yeah. diabetic to not having enough food, you know, it's just not going to yeah. work. So no. No. you will do anything. And, and it's really sad because you, you find women doing a lot of things they really wouldn't want to do. And um, we don't always get to talk about it. What happens is people think that women have these shelters they can go to. You know, just send them to the shelter. They'll be fine. But imagine raising your children in a shelter with other people who are coming in and out. It's just very, you know. It, it, yeah, it's, know it, it's, it's essentially an orphanage, yeah. you know. Yeah, but with the moms kind of there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but there's also so many rules, you know, when you're at a shelter. It's not your own place. There's never a place that's your own when you're a woman. If you're um, if you're if you're not financially able to basically stand independent by yourself, and you're still taking care of all these other people, there's no place that's really your own, you know. Yeah. So I feel like right now I'm very lucky to have my own place, but it's not um, I'm not standing alone either. My mom is still helping me, 
So yeah. if she, if my mom wasn't helping me, I'd lose this place immediately, even though it's government subsidized. My rent is only eighty-one dollars a month for a two-bedroom townhouse oh. in this little. Yeah, I'm in this little town in in um, rural West, East Texas. It's called Palestine, and so um, I'm in these subsidized apartments. But even Wonderful. with the subsidy, eighty-one dollars a month. Yeah. Right, but even with the subsidy, I can't actually afford it myself. My mom is helping me. She's paying my bills for me. So, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a six year old. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, my mom is in California, you know, so she's far away. But even so, I need to keep her happy. I want to make sure that she's always going to be on my side. Because she, if she pulls my support, that's it, you know. I'm in big mm -hmm. trouble immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I I That's always had that discussion with Fred um, when people were talking about how bad quote unquote things are in Chicago with the murder rate, and I go, "Well, that's literally where all this violence is happening is across seven blocks of a essentially million square mile metroplex, right? So." Mm -hmm. The actual area of danger is relatively small compared to what everything is. And I always said, no matter where you move, there's going to be problems. You're just changing whatever problem you have. You move from the inner city, gang violence and, and, and well, drugs are everywhere. You know, that, that could be the problem. You move out to the suburbs. Oh, it's opioids and vaping and all this other stuff that are that is killing people. And to oh, me... That's so Sad. <laughs> I know it's so sad for white people for them to be dying of opioid overdoses and vaping. <laughs> so well, um, it's really not a laughing matter. These uh, are the um, a death is a. I mean, these children are choose to die. People I, are choosing to die when they when they yeah. choose. You know these vices. Well, I, I don't I don't I don't think the situation's funny. To me, that's kind of how I cope yeah. with things. Is is I look oh, at it I know. and I totally I and, totally do that too when I when I'm uh, nervous and or, or upset by something. Yeah, and it it's it boggles my mind to why people decide that oh these people have a very specific problem that isn't my problem currently, so they're different from me. And in a lot of the the cases, it's you're worse than I am. Uh, so I think that, I think that's the real issue is that f from tribalism that is still ingrained in human society in human DNA of, of the idea of survival, right? Cause that sucks. Nobody wants to be dead that people say, well, their problems are different. They're not my problems because they're different. They're worse that you then have your splits in society of, okay, well, the black person's problem is that they don't have as many equal opportunities as I do. Well, that's not my problem. My problem is, is that I'm not getting paid enough at work, so we're going to unionize. And then all of a sudden, a different demographic moves in and has the same rights. And it's like, well, the union's not as strong as it used to be because it's not the same people that I recognize. So, you know, it's not as good. And I think that's I think that's a real issue. And um, and when it comes to political environments and how they deal with it, no one really does it well. I I had some, and I hate using this word, but I had some some hope when it came with Obama becoming president that people would say, okay, well, he's not really you know black. He's not really white. He's just a person. But then it, all of a sudden it was split off. Both Democrats and Republicans were guilty of this, uh, of classifying him just by the color of his skin. And I actually had a debate with a college professor about this because, you know, sociology, they, they go into, hey, one drop percentages, you know, if you have one drop of blood, you're black and all that. And I said, well, it's evolved more than that. It's social economics. It's white people don't want to be perceived to being poor. That's why when a black person moves into the neighborhood, the realty prices go down, even though that black person may be the most outstanding citizen ever. Simply because a black person moved in, your home is now worth less. And uh, worth, comma, less, or worth space less. Worth, worth less. <laughs> Not so, worthless. Yeah, worth less. Go ahead. And to me, that's, that's the problem, is that 
we can't seem to remove ourselves away from that. And to the credit of Yang suppo- supporters, most of them don't identify with, you know, unlike Faye, being Asian, most of them are, are white supporters. A lo- there are a lot of minority supporters, but a lot of them are white, uh, simply because of the demographics of this country. Uh, they haven't gone, oh, he's he's Asian, so we want to elect the first Asian president. Like, the Democrats wanted to do in 16, we want to elect the first female president. Which is mm-hmm. fine and great, but when you start doing that, then that just becomes its own thing. Uh, Identity politics. Right? Yeah. They call that. yeah. And when you start doing that, then you start losing the message. And I think that's part of why Yang struggled in Iowa, is that that identity politics started coming in. And I actually saw an interesting video um, online of a Kukbar or whatever her name is, Jill, the the doctor or whatever her name is, or Amy, Amy... Amy Klobuchar. 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 And one of her supporters uh, went to go vote, and when Klobuchar wasn't on the ballot, she decided that she wanted to vote for Buttigieg. But when Buddha Judge, yeah. so when uh, these these names and I'm German and 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 I live in a very large city that has a Polish demographic and these names are killing me and I can say the worst spelled Polish name you can you can imagine, and uh, she she was told okay awesome and then someone told her hey you know he's gay and she flipped out saying well that's against my religion. And, and they're going, well, it was commonly known. Well, they need to tell people. It's, it's commonly known he's gay. He's married to a man. She's like, well, I didn't know that because they focus. Oh, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Sorry. That means that we, that actually means that uh, Democrats are not focused on the, on the. Uh, no, they're only. Politics. They're only. No, they're only focused on which ones identify with them. That's what I'm saying is well, that. If they, if they, if because it was a woman. His message. Well, no, I'm mean, that Buddha judge is uh, staying on message, and if his message doesn't include whether or not he's gay, yeah, that's his identity. So well, he's right. not focused on identity politics. But what but I'm saying, what, th- so there are voters that 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 say they aren't. If they but are out something they don't like. But they are. They actually are. That's what I'm saying <laughs> is that there's that large hypocrisy yeah. there, even in what is the liberal party in America, is that it's still largely tied to the most well, now, basis of identity go ahead oh well <laughs> that what he said that if you're a democrat you can't be racist too <laughs> no 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 i i i, I know many uh, but i don't have a problem with that a democrat, you can't be you know against uh have the uh, religious uh beliefs that really you know kind of scary <laughs> but yeah no it's but my there point is, is that I'm not against that. If you want to vote for somebody that you identify with simply because of the color of their skin, I don't have a problem with that. But you just need to admit to that. That's that's if that's the only reason. I'm not saying Faye is doing that. I'm saying there are people who do that, and yeah, I have no problem. Well, I you... think she did admit to it. She she straight out said, "I want my thing back. <laughs> Give me my yeah, card back." Yeah, she did. <laughs> she did because the one that she wanted that she identified with probably because it was a woman and then said something that she really enjoyed that uh, 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 Klobuchar or whatever her name is, is going to Klobuchar is going to do for her. Um, she said, okay, well that's what I'm going to do. And then she, she backed away when she found out something negative about, or, or something that she perceived to be negative about mm-hmm. another candidate. And that's something I'm worried about with a lot of, Andrew Yang supporters. Fred and I had this discussion the other day. I know what a lot of them say. I know what a lot of them say, but I've been and involved with political discussions since I was a teenager. I know. And and here's the thing. I am a young, uh, well, I'm not young anymore, but I am a middle-class white male, uh, admittedly. Uh And I know what they say and how they perform when it actually comes to crunch time. And that's hmm. that's the problem is that a lot of people aren't taking that into consideration. You just need to look at the previous election as to what happened, specifically with middle class white people. Half of middle class white women voted for Donald Trump. Why? Why did they do that? Who knows? Well, I'm, I, I'm going to say 
because, and uh, let me know if this sounds familiar to you, Faye, but um, mm -hmm. automation came and blasted away millions of manufacturing jobs in Wisconsin, Ohio. You heard this before? Um, oh, yeah. A, a lot of it, I, I'm quoting Yang here. A lot of this mm -hmm. is that we blew away a lot of jobs. We screwed, and, you know, a, a lot of people, well, we elected Trump because we're racist. We elected Trump because we are losing jobs all over the place. And it's not immigrants who are taking the jobs. It's machines. And but there Trump, is really, but Trump I, I think, sure made a good story. Ahead. But Trump He's, made sure made, made sure that we 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 pounded on the fact that it's definitely immigrants. <laughs> yeah. So and he was telling the story that everybody already believed. So it was easy yes. to believe him some more. And actually, that that's one of the things I advocate all the time, and I'll say it again: we have to get past the us versus them mentality, the tribalism. Wimpy swears that that is inherent in human beings, that we have been doing that from the beginning of time. And even if I admit that, and I do to a large extent, we are human, we are capable of change, and I really need us to get to the place where we can say uh, there is no them. We are all us. Whether you are Asian, black, female, male, gender fluid, uh, whatever your sexuality, whatever your religious beliefs, whatever your political leanings, uh, none of those things make the slightest bit of difference. You are human. And uh, right. from there, let's work. I'm, I'm very glad that you're different from me and that I'm different from Wimpy. I'm always very glad to be different from Wimpy, but, but I'm glad that we're all different. You lie, Fred. You wish you were young again. I know I really do. And you uh, hate that I'm right. And, and you hate that I'm right a lot of the time. I, I love that. But, but I'm different from you. Um, Wait, how old, how old are, are you, Wimpy? Uh, I am 33. Very nice. So do you do you count yourself as a millennial? Um, That's what's weird. I, I, I consider anyone born from 83 to 89 as a tweener. Um, because... I grew up with Generation X. I I remember the 90s, and half of the millennials don't remember the 90s. Like, when Clinton was being impeached, I was 10 years old. When 9-11 happened, I was 16. Half of the millennials weren't even 8 years old when 9-11 happened. So you can't tell me you experienced what is the defining thing for my generation the same way... A uh, sixteen and eight year old dead. No, a sixteen and eight is a huge difference. Yeah, you know, uh, thirty two and forty is nothing, but sixteen and eight is massive. Yeah, I mean, particularly in comprehending something like nine eleven. Yeah. So it's I was of the first generation that grew up on the internet. I was in the frontier versus oh these twenty somethings on you know Twitter. Well, they were fifteen years old in two thousand ten. I was twenty four. So you can't on, tell me what is what is the right word for Zephyr who is six years old? <laughs> Come on, Zephyr, you want to say hi? Um, hi. Hey, Zephyr, we're glad to have you. This is Fred and Wimpy. Hi, Fred. Hi, Zephyr. Wimpy? Say hi, hi, Wimpy. Wimpy. How's it going, Zephyr? He just he just came in from hey. playing. Good. Hmm. How's school going, so dude? I have a, even when I'm doing politics, I always have Zephyr with me. So when I'm teaching, so my, my usual job is teach as a private tutor, to math. So I love wearing my math hats. <laughs> oh, there you go. See? But, yeah, I teach all different things. I can teach language. I teach math. Um, so anyway, uh, but when I'm teaching, I bring Zephyr with me. So that's not easy to do. Zephyr has no, to be patient. And it's like he's at work, too. Well, good for him. That my children mature. have come with me. So my, my children have come with me on many different types of jobs. I'm always looking for a job where I can have my child with me. Mm -hmm. And um, my other children, I have two children that I never get to see um, after the whole family court issues and other, I had a lot of legal issues. Um, I never get to see my two older children, but uh, they also went to work with me when, I, when they were little um, after the divorce. So, yeah. Okay, let me help you. Um, guess what he likes to play, Wimpy? <laughs> um, Sid Meier's oh, no, Civilization. Of course not. 
going to say that would be interesting. A six-year-old playing Civilization. Unfortunately, I don't have nieces or uh, a niece or nephews that are in that age range. Uh, again, they are a little bit older, and one's a little bit younger. Um, but I'm assuming he loves playing on a tablet, and or a phone, and probably loves playing. Mm, I, I probably plays a Disney game. Is what I'm going to assume. Mm, I love Disney Interactive, but um, actually Zephyr is playing on my very old laptop. Uh -huh. It's still Windows 7, and uh, Windows 7 just stopped Seven? getting any sort of... Uh, it's no longer being supported Update. by Windows. Yeah. So we're not getting updates, and every day the computer is telling us something terrible is going to happen to it. <laughs> but Zephyr is playing um, Minecraft. Oh, he's playing that. Minecraft. Yeah, that's definitely was one of the big ones that... Uh, my niece and nephew were playing when they were six, seven years old. Because Minecraft is now over ten years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite and, old now because I remember trying to introduce it to my to my oldest son who is now nineteen. And when he was young, I tried to introduce it to him. I got him the stuff, and he was like, "No, no, thank you." You know, <laughs> because mom was not cool for offering it. But um, later, when he found out all his friends were playing it, all of a sudden, boom. He was on it. <laughs> and so yeah. actually when I was in Taiwan, I had a problem where my husband would not allow me, uh, my ex-husband at the time, would not allow me to um, take my children with me to Taiwan. He literally kept the children here in the United States and said it would be dangerous if I was uh, to be allowed to take them with me to Taiwan. So I was yeah. pregnant in Taiwan, couldn't fly back and forth to see them. And it was really sad. Because I thought they could come with me for the summer, and they could go back to their dad for the you know school year. That's what made sense sure. to me, you know. So um, <laughs> I didn't get to see them, and so instead I played Minecraft with them over a server, you know. So we could be on the same server playing the games together, and I think um, yeah. as a annihilation on it. He's playing the same game I used to play with my middle child Isaac. And uh, my oldest child, Sage, the two of them would take turns and play games with me, uh, usually Minecraft, using the, the headset. And we would spend so much mm -hmm. time together after school until they went to sleep that it was almost like I, I spent more time with them than their dad did in their own house. Right? Yeah. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, well, I, by I don't the way, think I that. Think his uh... genera yeah, I, I, Go think ahead. His genera I think his generation is called toddlers. But I'm not sure. Toddlers? No, Toddlers. no. Yeah, the, the old. No, no, he's definitely in the big boys already. The the <laughs> older, the older demographic hasn't yet uh, disparaged them yet, so that we have no name for them yet. Uh, we call okay. them. Uh, no, they just lovely children, children still. We're children. I will christen the name of the next generation right here and now for our convenience. Uh, they are Generation Doomed, because they're doomed. doomed. Oh, no. They are doomed. So you're thinking about Among, climate change and 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 uh, the uh, and the quick uh, that and I was and you know the quickly approaching fascism, but okay. Yeah, they are doomed thanks so, to uh, my parents and uh, Fred, okay. Fred's generation. Yeah, well, well I didn't do it. So I, don't bug Andrew, me. But, I voted for Clinton. Andrew so. Yang's family and my family have so many things um, that I that kind of intersect. Because, uh, you know, his oldest child has um, autism. And my yeah. ex-husband, my ex-husband also had, um, you know, the, something similar. And it was, mm -hmm. so I'm often thinking about some of the same issues that he's thinking about. Because these are genetic yeah. traits. And so I'm always wondering, you know, do my children, I wonder about my children, how they're going to do. And um, I also wonder right now i can't see my children and i'm wondering if they had the power right because my oldest child is now 19 and he has not contacted me yet because he's it's technically illegal i have a like a restraining order against me i can't even see him i can't talk to him and i often wonder if he had that thousand dollars a month would it help him to have more freedom so that he would feel like he would be safe to try to to try to you know get in touch with me but also yeah. because I can't see them, even if he just has that thousand dollars for daily living expenses and things like that, I feel like it would kind of 
give him his own independence away from, you know, his dad always providing him with things. So um, yeah. for young people, definitely, it's like, you know, you can, you can choose something. And parents all, aren't always the best choosers for you. <laughs> like, Not so I think much, um, no. right now, a lot of people are still stuck in that, um, you know, I think the older candidates on stage are saying things that are very old fashioned. There's things like, we're gonna give people more education and education will bring people out of poverty and stuff. Uh, when we are seeing, in fact, a lot of uh, college is overpriced. A lot of people come out of college and then can't get a job. And they're very disappointed by that, having done all this hard work, right? Gotten themselves into debt. And I think, how is it possible that they, they can see that there are people in debt, right? Come out of college and then try to mm -hmm. put more people into that system and to continue you know, it's like, uh, shouldn't we turn around and do something different? Like, I'm Andrew Yang because um, he's in that generation with me where we can kind of still bridge the older and younger, you know? Mm -hmm. We kind of understand the younger people because we're parenting them, you know, we're with them. And we yeah. play games with them. And we, we see the technology affecting them differently than how we were when we were kids, right? Yeah. And then we see the older people, and we, we remember all the times we've spent so much time teaching them how to program the VCR, <laughs> you know, teaching yep. them how to use their phone. I have a boss, you know, who used to, like, call me every other weekend just so I would come over and help him with his phone. And people were yeah. like, oh, he must really love you. You know, he, he must be, like, enamored with you or something. I'm like, no, no, he needs help with his phone, honestly, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, and you so, know, like, actually, the older you are, the less uh, the less uh, competent you are with technology in general. So I, I have a roommate who's not yet 30, and I'm always, here, will you fix this, please? I, you know, and Wimpy is in charge of technology on this show. I just do what I'm told. Right, right. So, I mean, there's, it's nothing wrong with that. It's just that at this point, if you're making all the decisions and you're not able to see even the technology that we've been teaching, you know, yeah. and then now we've got technology that the kids are mastering faster than we are it's really it's like just that isn't happened at the iowa caucuses i mean yeah. i was told by one of our local republican uh, i mean Republicans, our local democrats he's an older person and he said to me um on my that uh doesn't andrew yang know that this is a denial of service attack on the phone banks by the republicans and i thought well even if that were true <laughs> right but the old story is that, oh, well, the other side is attacking us, and we're going to, you know, get angry at them, and we're mm -hmm. going to, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, how, how will that help? What you do is prevent that from happening, right? It, yeah. And as Andrew Yang said, it was totally avoidable. Whatever yeah. happened, right, yeah. could have been planned in a way that it just wouldn't happen. And I think yeah. that's the dichotomy now. It's like at, at our age, about 45 or so, none of, nobody from the age of 45 and below is going to believe that story that, you know, mm -hmm. we were just incredibly incompetent. Because <laughs> if they no. just brought one person in of the right, right, we would have said yeah. you need to do this. <laughs> well, well, it's it's it sounds like you're not familiar with people from Iowa like I am. <laughs> but, uh, okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> And this is just me being slanderous toward Iowa, but <laughs> their public education system is not very good. Their whole structure isn't very good. The only thing good I could say about Iowa when it comes to public services is that barely their their child protection services are okay. Barely. Uh, because my two oldest uh, niece and nephew are adopted. And... Okay. My brother and sister now live in Arizona, and they were before they had uh, an a, a natural born child because they were told they would never have one. They were looking to adopt another one, and they were going through the uh, Arizona process of doing it. And my sister in law was saying how more difficult it is to do that in Arizona simply because there's not the funding there is, there's not anything there structurally put in place because Arizona for most of its existence has been Republican. So yes. mm -hmm. when they cut funding from that and they don't support those types of things and they say they do, but they don't. And the whole system gets messed up because of uh, perceived uh, uh, slights that, Oh, if we're supporting this and all this stupidness, <laughs> It, it affects kids. And I think w you were talking about education earlier with 
hey, there are tons of students now in debt, and a bachelor's degree no longer means what it used to 40 years ago. Uh, the, yeah, no, I have one of those, and uh, I'm facing homelessness. So the right the reason for that is, and there's, there's a multitude of reasons, but the real reason why the degree isn't worth what it is anymore was because businesses and large corporate and, and multi-millionaires and billionaires saw that, well, we have to pay the people who have the degrees more money. How do we have them cost less money? What do you do? Oh, we'll increase competition for those jobs. Thusly, we can hire somebody who's willing to take less. And mm -hmm. less, and less, and less, and less, and less, and less, and less, until everyone who has a bachelor's degree averages roughly around $32,000 a year. Yeah. That's yeah. what they've done. But, I mean, okay, I have a bachelor's degree that I was told I can't really do anything special with it because it's not special enough, right? Mm -hmm. I have a degree in integrative biology. I have a minor in French. What am I going to do with these things? The only way, the only thing that I would give me work in biology itself would be to go for an additional degree. So mm -hmm. I would have needed another degree to be a PhD, mm -hmm. or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, in order to uh, be a zoologist. Mm -hmm. So um, so that many years of, of uh, being in school would into your parenting time, would it not? And yes. this really severely affects uh, women. Mm -hmm. And we have, okay, so people are always saying, well, we don't know what causes autism, but we do know one thing about autism, which is that the older the parent, the more, more likelihood of getting an autistic child and mm -hmm. increasing everybody's age of you know conception and starting families and stuff like that and we're saying we need to do more of that i'm not sure that's really a great idea especially for women i don't think we should be building a society where women have to have all these things in place you know stability the partner um you know the possible what if you need to get away right because <laughs> you don't know yeah. how your relationship's going to change once once you actually have children and the stress all comes into it yes um you know and all of those things are built in in order for you to have a child in order to be the smart person um that doesn't seem smart to me this is not a good society that we're building and um i feel like um there's enough women who choose not to have children or who don't want to have children that we're not going to have overpopulation like people have been talking about you know, I think we've lived too many years in the that people are bad, okay? And people are, uh, like, having children is bad. Uh, that's the right. thing that really hurts me when I hear somebody say, oh, um, you know, poor single mom shouldn't be out there having children and stuff like that. That really, um, I, I'm like, how is that possible that you get to decide that poor people don't get to have children, right? And correct me that's if I'm wrong. Disgusting. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there an Asian country now? that has a limit on childbearing or do uh, I that's that right? china that's why that's why there's 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 now more men in the world um because of, of the chinese policies for children rearing and the fact that um in china uh the tradition is for the first male of the family to take care of the parents so what was happening in the late 80s and 90s was China saw a population boom after uh, World War II, much like the rest of the world did. And there were so many firstborn females that the older generation wasn't being taken care of. So what happened was that generation that followed said, well, we want to be taken care of. We're going to ensure that we have a firstborn son to where they were having illegal abortions, they were selling children, they were, you know, legally having programs to where you could adopt children internationally that weren't wanted. And now China has a very bad population problem where I think it's like 57% male and 43% and female. There's a large disparity between the male population to where yeah. I, I think there's something like 300 million single males that will never have a mate because there's not enough females. Yeah. So that's kind of a problem. And if you remember... Well, there's a lot of problems to it because we've always been thinking about how, oh, we're going to overpopulate, we're going to destroy the environment by population and all this. And really, it's uh, it's coming down to that most countries, especially industrialized nations, are really um, have a deficit of children. We don't have enough, right? We've got this uh, inversion model now. We've got more older people than younger people. 
and that's creating the need for more automation. But, but you know, the younger people can't uh, can't really take care of the olders and the youngers all at once when there's fewer of us. But I, I don't of us. I don't think that's a population problem, though. I don't think that's a I don't think that's a numbers problem. I think the problem is is that even though you may have the resources to support all of this, the fact is is that the society is structured to where people can't support themselves unless they have a partner. And that's the problem. You don't have that individual freedom. You don't have that individual build building. Versus during the 1950s, it was men had most of the rights. So they were able to be the ones working because they were being paid significantly more than the women. And since then, and again, Wimpy's saying controversial things, and he doesn't mean this in a bad way. When women were introduced into the workforce and getting better jobs and improving their social standards that also helped you know the reaganomics of raising the tide well it didn't so much raise the tide as it balanced the tide and fred knows i think of balance in the universe i think balance is a good thing it's just that the people in charge of that balance are the problem that they have so much influence over yours and mine day-to-day -day life that you really don't have freedom. And George Carlin said it best. You have a list of privileges, not a bill of rights that can be revoked at any time your overlords decide to revoke them. And right. to me, that's the problem, which is why, and, and Fred is amazed by this, is that I'm an anarchist. I, I'm not on a burn. Uh -huh. I'm not burn it down. I'm no, there should be no government because as soon as you give uh -huh. people power, what happens? They want more, and they want more, and they want more, and they want more. And if you don't Before want... Before Gang came along, I say that I'm right there with you, Wimpy. I kind of do believe in anarchy because, to me, anarchy is every single piece of life that's happening without your brain, for example, in your body. Mm -hmm. Like all these Things out of your control. <laughs> right. The autonomous systems in your body that happen even if your brain is not is incapacitated. That's mm -hmm. sustaining your life, right? If you forgot to think about breathing, you're still breathing. If mm -hmm. you forgot to digest your food, your brain, you're not thinking about it, but it's still happening. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for me, anarchy is definitely very important in the society. But when Andrew Yang comes along and he's telling us about <laughs> these great, um, these great improvements we can make, um, in sort of, uh, he's proposing things that will solve a lot of the structural problems of money that we have right now. It's going to solve a lot of the structural um, differences in power differentials that we have in our society because we, you know, kind of peg all of our power to financial. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to start uh, changing those things, then we can have um, a functioning brain that is actually doing good things and allow us to, as a society, to do things that anarchy doesn't allow us to do. But right. But I feel like anarchy is the basis. That we have to support that. That's what freedom is. But when but we talk about you, freedom, it's really in our. You're 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 making a big assumption though in the structure of society, in that you will you're assuming that they're that human beings as a whole, uh, aren't serving for themselves first. Again, not saying that's a bad or a wrong thing. Um, there are instances what do you where mean they're not for so themselves first, so I don't understand what you're saying. even though the freedom dividend is a great thing and I agree with it, a lot of the people voting for it are voting for it because it's something that they need, right? Yes. And yeah, and that the that. people who are going to vote for Joe Biden, I guarantee you, they don't need the freedom dividend. All right. Well, let's that say, divide. We don't have the freedom dividend. Okay, this is why people are talking about we are close to a revolution, but nobody knows it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that much about Chinese legislation right now. Like for example, what you said, I don't know that much about it. I believe that they're actually loosening those. They are uh, now. If they, yeah. If they haven't gotten rid of, if they haven't gotten rid of them, they've, they've been loosening them because mm -hmm. of this. You know, structural. Dis the society is the pyramid is getting reversed. Um, but in in China, my grandparents came from China. So my grandparents actually fled Shanghai. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandparents on my dad's side, they were part of the wealthy, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when the wealthy people were doing things that um, completely disregarded the, the, you know, poor people around them, um, they became the corrupt people. And the people rose up against them. And that's mm -hmm. what the communists were. The communists came and wiped them out. 
they took everything my grandparents and their uh, grand their my great grandparents had but i don't hate them because that's to me that's that was the, the people needed to live and and it happens quickly this mm -hmm. is what people don't understand about revolutions it's like you talk about it yeah it's coming it's coming but when it comes it's like overnight it will happen so fast if if it didn't happen quickly then in every revolution in the past right uh, the all these uh, wealthy people would have known about it and they would have left and they would have been safe well my grandparents leave they knew things were really bad they went to taiwan right along with like two million other people the diaspora and but while while they were leaving they left behind five children so <laughs> so oh like my. yeah in the end four of months ended up on the other side of a political divide which was nothing but this little tiny little straight little tiny bit of water between the island and the mainland and they didn't see their children again for 40 years. So, so when it does happen, it's not expected, right? If you could expect it, you would be safe. All the wealthy people would flee to Switzerland or flee somewhere, but they're not going to do that. They're going to think everything's okay right up to the very end. That's what we're looking at in the United States. Now, if you don't have the freedom dividend and you don't have something that makes people pay again, this if this continues in the trend that we're looking at, this is why... I believe Andrew Yang would be as afraid as I am, okay? Because we've we've had a kind of a joint um, history, uh, geopolitical history that we've shared with the entire planet, but other people aren't looking at it the way we do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're looking at a possibility of revolution when people cannot survive. And that's happening to so many people. It's happening to Fred right now, yeah. right? He's at the yeah. point where there's a chance he will not be able to survive a summer a hot summer or a cold winter. Mm -hmm. We're looking at people who are on the verge of death. And this is very, very serious, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you feel like the government is waging war on you and your children, okay, this is why people don't want to give up their guns. There really are people in the world who believe that they're going to protect themselves with their guns one day because yeah. they've seen what horrible poverty is, is around them. Yeah. And, and they don't see the government doing anything about it. And, um, and that's, when, uh, that's when that anarchy is going to come up. It's, when, it's like when you try not to breathe, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the government, mm -hmm. your brain is saying, don't breathe, right? You want to yeah. hold your breath because you're swimming or whatever you're doing. But when you need it, when you need that breath, you're going to breathe. <laughs> you're going to try well, to breathe. Yeah, you, no, you, you know? absolutely will. You're right. Yeah, yeah. That's One more thing I want to bring up. Do. One more yeah, thing I want to bring so. up before we are done today, and just because this has been on my mind a lot. Um, Faye, I don't know if you know the group, um, and if you don't, good for you. But there is a group called uh, People Who Know Yang Beats Trump or something, and it had originally been a Donald Trump Facebook group. Someone, one of their administrators, got yanged, got turned over to be a Yang person, so he reconstituted the group, essentially, to make it a Yang group with a bunch of Trump supporters in it who are very, you know, angry, and they say all sorts of horrible things that generally my Yang folks don't say, which is something I like about it. But one of the things I've been seeing <laughs> in that group, well, I don't, you know, libtard, come on, I have no interest in talking to you. Um, and I feel the same way about people that refer to Trump as, you know, giant Cheeto or something. You're not having a conversation. You're trying to see if you can best somebody else with sixth grade insults. But something I've seen. Welcome to America. And, it, and this is my side, right? And I don't like to say sides. For me, we're all, we're all us. But nevertheless, the liberals, the, the, or in my case, the idealists. One, uh, something I'm seeing a lot of lately, I'm sure everybody knows Rush Limbaugh has recently been diagnosed with cancer and oh really you had not heard this. okay no um and i it's why he got the medal right anybody who knows me oh i did not know that okay. hey, he yeah. got he got he got the presidential uh, presidential medal, of, medal freedom. of freedom freedom yeah and anyone who knows me will be able to guess rather quickly i am not a rush limbaugh fan okay he said Bye. some really <laughs> atrocious things but liberals or the left or whatever are frequently posting memes and other things about how they really want Rush Limbaugh to die a slow horse death. Cut it out. Okay, I, I'm with you that he is not a good guy. 
He certainly didn't deserve the Medal of Freedom. Uh, but we don't wish death on people. And it really bothers me to see people that I generally think of on, on my side wishing for someone else's death. And I would like to hear right. from both of you about this. Where, where do you both land on that issue? I'm going to let Wimpy go first. What do you think? Uh, Fred knows where I stand on this. It's You can wish upon anything you want on, on another person. I am, as long as you understand <laughs> that if said thing happens to you and everyone says you're crying about it, that you deserve it. That's that's kind of my oh. thing. I, I I am I am a I am a own what you say. I don't care what you say, but you need to own it. And well, also you have to be able to take what you dish. This is exactly what yeah, and, that, and that's that's the point. You can be a scumbag, but you can't complain when uh, when other people are being scumbags to you. So I look at it from both ways. Rush Limbaugh scumbag. People saying he should die of cancer <laughs> are scumbags for saying it, but he's a scumbag. So one, we shouldn't be surprised, and two. He kind of deserves it. And three, I don't really care. So, fuck him. Okay. <laughs> it, it just bothers me when I see it. But, all right, Faye, what are your thoughts about this? Well, okay, so that's another thing is I believe that um, even though Andrew is American and born here, that he probably has been influenced by some of the kinds of traditions and moral upbringings that, you know, Taiwanese people usually give their children. And mm -hmm. one of those is definitely unity. Right. And the first thing right. is we, we were people that just went through like our civil war. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, just in our grandparents time, they were the people who were in it. So we haven't really we've seen what is how horrible it is when people can't get along. And yes. we see how horrible it is when rich people are sent away. Right. Because, yeah, the wealthy are terrible, but they were our parents. They were our grandparents. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they went through theirs, you know. And then they built Taiwan, so they did a good job in some ways, and they did terrible things in others. So one of the things that we do when we mature is we have to integrate the good with the bad, okay. right? You take your yeah. parents for their good and their bad. There's a thing when, when you're very small, you think your parents can do no wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Everything about your parents is great. I've got sure. one of those angry parents. And uh, the studies say that if you have one of those, then then the way that you deal with it in your mind as a kid is you say, well, there's the good one. And then when the bad one comes, you actually think of them as almost a different person, right? Mm -hmm. You separate them out. Like, this is the good one when my mommy loves me and is nice to me. And this is the bad one that comes to yell at me when, I'm, when I do something she doesn't like. <laughs> yeah, right, right, okay. <laughs> okay, so as you get older, though, you have to kind of integrate that. And realize that you know your dad is also the Darth Vader. You know, yeah, <laughs> your dad right. is also, you know, is also the person that provided for you. And um, you know, they're both good and bad. And that's uh, one of the things in Taoism that we have. And not only that, it's funny because his name is Yang, and so people yeah, immediately yeah. think of Yin and Yang. Yeah, right. But right. what people in the United States probably don't understand about those symbols in Tao, they're part of a whole. So it's not like yin is uh, bad and yang is the good. It's more like right. uh, light and dark. If you don't have darkness, how would you know what's light? The universal right? balance. There it the, is. The balance the again. Balance. Zero. Okay, so miss miss, miss mathematician, right? The balance of zero. Zero is the number in between all other numbers, right? All other numbers. <laughs> okay. And then there's also like a dot of of black in the white it's mm -hmm. swirling around so it looks like it's starting one and ending the other and then the other one starts from it and ends again with the other and yeah. it also has a dot of each so the white yeah. one has a dot of black the black has a dot of white and that's that's everybody everybody is good and bad so when you mm -hmm. say somebody is a great hero because he makes great movies and then mm -hmm. you uh you know tear him down next day because he you know, did something to his daughter or tried to marry her or something, right? <laughs> you know, we're Woody talking Allen, about yes. now. But, okay, yeah. Right? Yeah, he, but there's Wimpy a lot doesn't of know Woody like Allen, that. but okay. I know who Woody Allen is! Okay, so then you know the incident, right? Well, uh, yes! Okay. Yeah, him and Roman Polanski, <laughs> yes. I know who those people are, Fred. <laughs> Fred, Fred, you know I'm a connoisseur of bad movies, and that's what Woody Allen movies are. They're bad. No, no, no. See, we're going to argue that on a different episode. But all right, go ahead. And say, finish that. <laughs> well, we're talking about, but basically there's that, uh, we've been taught from childhood this different morality that all people are good and bad. Mm -hmm. And so when you 
when you talk and they talk about them in psychology sometimes they say well you know you still love your sister even if she does something she you don't like so you can be angry at her behavior and ask her to change her behavior but you have to be angry at that person forever and, and that's how i feel about rush limbaugh or somebody who's done terrible things that and, we don't like and i i, I would <laughs> we don't like it you I, know, but he's still a person i i would i would contest that there is there has to be some level of contriteness that you have to be apologetic and know that you did something wrong before you deserve said uh, 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 empathy from other people. Um, there are things that you can do, and because here's the thing, Fred doesn't wish cancer upon anyone, but uh, Hitler, would you wish cancer upon Hitler? Would you? I don't know. You know. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a yes. I think, I think that's I a would. yes. That's a yes. You see, would? see, reluctant yes. Okay. See, okay, but on. why? Be... But why? I because he was reason. unapologetic Listen. for it. That's why. <laughs> That's why. He killed six million people. And yeah, and he wasn't sorry two, for it. Killed... How how many people yeah. have? How many people were killed because of the United States military corps in World War II? Yeah. I know. All right. And any any right. type of right. any type of person killing person is not a good thing. Okay. Even if it's right. in defense but of yourself. Hold on. But but uh, but in a sense, though, I believe that Fred is really wishing that because he would wish that on him before, uh, so that he could maybe. It's like a solution to the final solution. If yeah. Hitler wasn't there, the solution wouldn't have happened, right? It would. It would be. Yeah, sure. It would. And I mean, how many hundred? It would. It would be the penultimate solution. <laughs> that's what Fred wants. He wants the but penultimate that's just like solution. A solution to stop the the bad thing from happening. That's all. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not that because he hates Hitler or like he even knows who he is. Well, you know, thank it's, you very much story. for joining us today, Faye. Um, it's been delightful oh, okay. for having you on. We we only go for about an hour. I have something to do yeah, in we're thirty over minutes. Top already, yeah. so absolutely sorry so, about that. And it's not no, a problem. Uh, we, we open up time. Remember, you can get in contact with us at frontporchpodcast1 at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter, Podcast Front. If you haven't yet, please click that follow button here on Twitch. We are 15 people away from getting monetized. That means absolutely nothing to you, our audience. That means everything to me and Fred. That If we get monetized, it would be fantastic. Uh, going forward, we're going to continue doing this. Uh, I made it to, I think I'm in the classical age here in civilization. We've got well three done. cities and we've got about four other civilizations around us. We're going to conquer them, um, with our, uh, our, a, uh, our centuries and our horses probably next time here on the front porch podcast. Thank and you remember. for having me. Goodbye. Thank you, Faye. We were glad to have you. And folks, remember... <laughs> There's always someone on the front porch. So please, please come here and stay with me for a while. Is all I see through these tears. All these years, we got never come. Waking up. I thought could be 
So when it's all come undone, we will still see the sun. So please, please, don't cry. I will separate you all so soon under the California sky. We need the feel light. For me, no. You defy all I thought could be. When it's all said and done, we will still see the sun so please Don't you cry? I will sit with you. 